This is a pretty classic situation that we're in right now. Uh, a floodplain um, that was uh, grazed with livestock in the past. Now we have uh, turned it into a riparian forest buffer. This buffer was planted spring 2019, um, and we're doing pretty good. As you can see, we have a lot of really good growth here. Um, and uh, one of the things that we really wanted to focus on discussing is our understory and kind of the unkempt nature of this buffer. Um, because this is kind of what you could expect as a pretty average situation in these uh, floodplains on an ag ag formerly agricultural area. Where we do have a lot of growth. Um, this species here is reed canary grass. Um, it's a non-native introduced species. Um, introduced actually so that um, because it does well in uh, wetlands and floodplains, um, introduced for livestock forage. Um, but it turns out it's not very good for livestock forage um, and it uh, forms monocultures very easily. It's a really big challenge that we have um, in reforestation because it inhibits uh, any natural regeneration um, and it harbors those meadow voles very, very well. So you can see here, um, our maintenance is, is going according to plan. Um, if this was not mowed uh, earlier this summer, it would be seven feet tall or so right now. So we could tell it is being maintained. It's about, you know, a foot, foot and a half tall. Um, and this is late August, so within about a month or so, um, it will be mowed down again. Um, additionally, you can see there are rings of herbicide around each tree. Um, now, one thing that could really enhance the winter tree survival is, so yeah, all this grass here is dead around the tree, but it'll just be a mat of dead vegetation rather than a mat of, you know, a, a live vegetation. Um, so uh, raking away, all of the debris away from the tree going into winter can really help increase survival. But again, this is pretty good site. Even though it looks a little rough, um, there's kind of, there's a lot going on. It doesn't look like a, a manicured area, but this is more what we want to see um, and something that's gonna uh, be a lot more cost effective than coming in and constantly brush hogging and, and keeping it manicured. Um, additionally, you'll see there's a lot of good uh, volunteer species, wildflowers, all sorts of diversity coming up in here. Not a lot of tree regeneration again because of the reed canary grass, but um, by only maintaining what we have to, brush hogging twice, maybe three times a year per growing season for the, the first couple years, um, we're, we're striking a good balance between maintenance and, um, and a natural area. Maintenance is actually pretty simple uh, to make sure that we are suppressing uh, vole pressure. Um, reducing vole habitat um, and reducing competing vegetation, uh, sucking up light and nutrients and water um, that the trees could be using. That's really all the maintenance is about. Um, however, when you get down to it, um, it could be a little challenging on these floodplain sites um, and riparian forest buffer sites. So a big part of that is making sure there's no vegetation growing around each tree. What we're doing with that is again, suppressing vole cover. Um, it is more of a behavioral thing than a, a, a physical barrier. What we're doing is we're creating a, an open space around each tree um, so that the voles are not comfortable coming out in the open where they might get picked off by predators. And so then they're a lot less likely to get into these shelters, which are perfect little vole houses over the winter where they would build a little nest, hang out, girdle the tree, move on to the next tree. Um, additionally, there's a lot of evidence that they're doing habitat management by doing that. Um, they're killing trees so that it's not a perch for a predator in the future, which is pretty interesting uh, and cool. I just wish they would do that you know, somewhere else where we're not trying to establish trees. But this is what the herbicide ring will look like um, after a few months. This was sprayed in early June um, and uh, it's, it's doing pretty well here. Um, so again, we have reed canary grass here. Um, this species is very, very fast growing, uh, cool season species. Um, so I like to hit it a little bit later uh, with the mow and the spray than you would um, other species because by mowing it down after its big spurt of growth early in the season, um, it's gonna be somewhat low for the rest of the summer. And you can see, especially how hot this summer was, the reed canary grass didn't grow too much this summer. Um, now, as we move into September, it'll hit another burst, um, but then it'll be time for another mow in you know, uh, mid to late September, and that'll cut it down for the winter. Um, one thing in particular uh, with the reed canary grass or any other cover um, around the trees, we can see here there's still a lot of space for voles to uh, crawl underneath that mat of vegetation 
and still get to our trees. So even though it is very labor intensive in situations like this where we have a lot of vole pressure and I have had, this is only the second growing season, but the first growing season, there was a lot of vole mortality, even though we were following the prescribed maintenance procedures. Um, coming in here and just raking away debris from as many trees as we possibly can really helps increase the survival over winter. Um, so additionally to that, that mowing and the spraying, uh, what I call TLC or, or babysitting kind of tasks are really important. Just, just uh, general tree care for each individual tree. Um, so these shelters are fantastic for, for preventing deer browse, um, but cause a lot of other issues. Um, so there's a couple different problems we can see. Um, the first one, the immediate one that you'll have to counter is the bird nets. So we put on these nets that exclude songbirds from going down inside the shelters. They work very, very well for that. But a lot of the species we plant are fast growing pioneer species. And so they can grow up into those bird nets before we get a chance to pull them down. Um, and so what we'll get is a situation like this over here, where we have, this is a sweet gum that I planted uh, as part of my replanting this spring. And we can see it is starting to get tangled in this bird net. Um, and I'm hoping it's not as bad as it looks here. So what, what part of the just kind of tree care is going around to each individual tree and removing these bird nets, um, either when the tree is, is getting close to touching it or when it, w it should surpass that by the next time you'll be able to come around and, and check on it. So we were actually able to avoid any permanent damage here, but we will see some trees you can see it's, it was starting to get a little um, uh, corkscrew a little bit under the pressure of that net. Um, there are a couple different, there, there are many different um, tree shelter systems. Um, this one has a very wide gauge uh, bird exclusion net, which is kind of nice. It's a little bit more forgiving than some that have a tighter gauge um, because as you can see, some of the leaves will poke through um, and it's a little bit less suppressive. Um, but there are plenty of instances here where we are potentially going to have some long-term damage um, from the tree getting caught in the net. Um, we just have to go find them. Here is unfortunately a situation where the bird net has caused damage on the sycamore. Um, sycamore is one of my favorite species. It grows so fast. It's very tough. It's very hardy. But as you can see here, it is incredibly tangled in this bird net. Um, what may have happened here is uh, I might have trusted that the bird net wasn't going to cause much damage because it's so open here, um, or perhaps it was slid down even further and this stem got caught in there. So you can see this essentially right angle that that tree has made, um, that's not really going to uh, uh, be a, a good long-term position for that branch. Um, and this is the terminal. So this should be, you know, someday 150 feet up in the sky, but. Um, because I was more negligent than I should have been uh, about checking up on this site. Um, that one won't be. We'll try to inspire another one to be. Uh, so let me get in here. Um, while we're at it, we do have some very common uh, species that you'll find in buffers. Um, this right here is giant ragweed. Uh, it is a relative of our common ragweed, uh, much maligned species for um, increasing allergies. So hopefully I'm not uh, allergic to it. Uh, I've started to gain new allergies as I age, um, but I, I think I'm okay with this giant ragweed. But again, it's native, it's actually annual. Um, and as you can see, it can completely dominate an area between the trees. Um, so that's one of the situations where it is a good thing to have around. Um, uh, you can see there's a lot of bugs um, feasting on it, uh, and the seeds from, from ragweed species are really great for songbirds, but um, brush hogging this down would help give our trees a little bit more sunlight. Uh, but so for the sycamore, again, what we're going to do, uh, well, I need to hand weed this first, and I'm going to hope that that's not nettle. I believe it is, and I don't have gloves, so I'll do this one for science. Um, we can also see the herbicide, oh, thank you. The herbicide application could have been a little bit better in here. Uh, so we're gonna try to clear out all this canary grass first. 
And you know, one of the reasons why I love sycamore, again, it's very tough. Uh, it's a very fast grower, really thrives in these um, uh, super wet soils um, and uh, poor soils in general. Um, it, I've you know seen it growing in gravel parking lots. Ooh, yep, yep, that's stinging nettle, everyone. <laughs> um, but it will bounce back. So what we're gonna do here as I slide the shelter back down, we'll make sure this is a really important, you know, we need to be careful, even though, again, this does take a lot of time. We don't want it to get bent as we slide the shelter back down. You know, the shelter maintenance is all about keeping the tree healthy and growing, growing well. Uh, okay. So double checking is oftentimes pretty prudent. Uh, but now, unfortunately, we have to do a little surgery on this guy. And as I was lifting that, I broke another piece off. But so what might happen, this bud right here may become the, the terminal lead. Uh, but I will cut it a little bit below that damage and we'll hope for the best. But again, this is why we have to come out and, and check these bird nets, um, especially for pioneer species, for our fast growers, um, for the first couple of years. This kind of work, the hand weeding, the bird nets, as time goes on, after year two, sometimes year three, you don't have to do it anymore because all the trees are, are past that point. Um, but the first couple of years, just another reason why the maintenance is, is utterly critical in the early stages. Mm -hmm.